So this is problem number five from the 2022 AP Calc AB free response set. It's a question involving differential equations. So they present us with a differential equation. A lot going on with it. Uh, they tell us y equals f of x is the particular solution to the differential equation that has initial condition f of 1 is 2, or when x is 1, y is 2. And it tells us this function f is defined for all real numbers. So in part a, we are asked to take this slope field for the differential equation and sketch the solution curve through the ordered pair 1 comma 2. So they place the ordered pair 1 comma 2 onto the slope field for us and you just have to do your best to try to use the slopes that are indicated by these line segments as the slope of your tangent line to guide your graph up into the first quadrant and then back down toward the x-axis. Uh, and then down toward the origin, but then back up into the second quadrant and then back down toward the x-axis here. So we're just using the slope field as a guide for the slope of our tangent line. Um, this graph, I mean, the slope field has a, a lot of symmetry to it, so I tried to draw my graph as symmetrically as possible. I mean, this is a little bit ugly to try to do by hand, so as long as you have tried your best to, to use the slopes uh, as, as well as you could, and you don't have any blatant situations where, say, like in this vertical right here, you were like looking at a, a positive slope through that vertical. That would be an issue. But as long as you're using your, your curve and the slopes that you're provided with as well as you can to draw your curve, uh, you should be in good shape. It is a, a, an approximate solution curve. It's not going to be perfect whenever we build a solution curve into a slope field like this. Part B asks us to write an equation for the line tangent to the solution curve at the point 1, 2, and then we want to use the equation to approximate f of point 8. So if you're building the equation of the tangent line, you need two things. You need to know the ordered pair. That's already fully formed here. Uh, and then you also need to know the slope of your tangent line. Well, the slope of your tangent line comes from the value of, of your derivative. So if we evaluate this derivative at the x value of 1 and the y value of 2, it ends up looking like this. Now I built this crazy looking, this is a point slope tangent line that you see across this line right here. You know, this would receive full credit for the equation of the tangent line. Uh, it's not dependent on f, it's not dependent on f prime or dy dx or anything else. Uh, it's, it's a calculation that I can definitely simplify, but as you've heard me say in, in likely other videos, you don't have to do that in the free response setting on the AP calculus exam. So, I left my answer looking ugly like this initially, um, and then I went ahead and did my approximation, right? There was a follow-up part, so use the equation of your line to approximate f of 0.8. So that's going to amount to us putting 0.8 in place of the x in the equation of our line. Now we would have to find the y value, so I would have to add this 2 across to the other side. You know, this line right here would receive full credit for your approximation. Um, I did try to simplify this a little bit. Um, if we go back to part A, at the x value of 0.8, so here was the place that we started at the x of 1, at the x value of 0.8, our y value should, should seem like it's going to be a little bit beneath 2. And so I just kind of realized that if, if I cleaned this calculation up a little bit and tried to simplify it, this is 1.7 little below 2, supported by the slope field that we had back in part A. Of course, you don't have to do what I've done across this bottom line, but I just felt that in this case it was a little opportunity for a little bit of a built-in check to refer back to what we had done back in part A. In part C, it's a follow-up with that approximation from part B. So they tell us that the second derivative is positive for f for the stretch of the x-axis from negative 1 to 1. If the second derivative is positive on that interval, you know your function is concave up on that interval. If your function's concave up on that interval, so I, I just kind of drew a brief little graph here. So my red curve is, is just a little stretch of f of x. My blue line is my tangent line. So I've got the ordered pair 1, 2 on both the tangent line and the, the red curve. And then I've got the ordered pair 0.8 comma 1.7 only on the line. So we're asked to try to decide if that approximation of 1.7 is an overestimate or an underestimate for f of 0.8. Well, since this graph is concave up, 
the graph is going to lie above the tangent line at the place where we made our estimate. Because of that, the y value from the line is a bit of an underestimate for the y value from the curve. We're approximating the y value from the curve with the y value from the line. Clearly, the line is slightly beneath the curve based on this sketch. Sorry about the little jumpiness in the video there. I had an issue with my original solution to part D, and I had to try it again. So here's take two. Part D asks us to use separation of variables to try to find a particular solution to this differential equation with the condition f of 1 is equal to 2. So when you separate your variables, you're just doing algebra to move any of the y's over to the side of the equation with the dy. The dx is going to come over and join the x's. So I think the separation step is pretty obvious here. You then integrate both sides. The integral on the left is one that I would be a little worried about maybe someone going to a formula involving a natural log for. Um, I can definitely move this across the fraction bar with some exponent properties and, and not have too difficult of a time dealing with what's on the left side of the equation involving the y's. I do technically need to do a u substitution. If I was to let u equal what's inside this set of parentheses here, my derivative is 1. I don't have any other y's outside the parentheses that would need to be substituted in with or canceled out with. So I just kind of went ahead and, and jumped straight to my antiderivative on this left hand side which is going to require me to add one to the exponent so get to a positive one half exponent divide by that new exponent dividing by one half same as multiplying by two and that's what I get for the antiderivative on the left now the antiderivative on the right you do have to let u equal what's inside the sine function now if you do that you're going to pick up this factor of two over pi and if you have the time and and you're not rushed at all, you can definitely go ahead and show those substitution steps and, and confirm for yourself that this is the, the new factor that sneaks into your antiderivative on the right hand side. So I copied the one half. This came from my u substitution. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. I've already back substituted the inner function back for u, and that's the side of the equation that I want to have my plus c on. From there, I am going to want to try to isolate y. Now, you do have an option with what you choose to do. You can either put your condition 1 in for x, 2 in for y. You can put that in right here at this line and try to solve for c. It's, it's the only thing that I sometimes see my students do when they do that at this point, particularly if there are absolute values involved, if there's possibly a plus or minus in front of a root involved, I see them tend to kind of overlook little details like that. So I typically, in, in my solutions, isolate y, find the general solution uh, in an explicit form. And so I've just done a little bit of algebra throughout these bottom few lines on the left side of the screen. I guess we can kind of talk through them. I, I Oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? Okay, I think maybe the third time's a charm here. So you might have seen 2 over pi's as the coefficient of all these cosines, negative 2 over pi's, I should say, uh, before I paused the video again and, and made some adjustments. So as I was looking at this algebraic step to get from this line to this line, I'm not going to be multiplying by 2 to get rid of the 2 that's in front of the the root as its coefficient, I'm going to be dividing by 2. I don't have to show the, the c being divided by 2. I don't know the value of c based on the work that I'm currently doing, so I can just leave that as, as a plus c rather than a c divided by 2. It's, it's okay if you do it as c over 2 or handle it that way, uh, but you just have to stay consistent with whatever your choice is throughout the rest of your steps. And my choice is to not show the C being impacted by multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, anything like that. So from there, I would have to square both sides. Uh, now, I can't get away with squaring the first term and then squaring the second term. I have to square the entire side, right? And then I would have to subtract 7 to completely isolate y. So this should be a better version of my general solution now that I caught that my coefficient was off. And if I plug in my initial condition, when x is 1, y is 2, 2 goes in for y, 
uh, one goes in for x, and when one goes in for x, we get cosine of pi by two. Well, cosine of pi by two is zero, so this term floats away. We just have c squared minus seven is equal to two. So if I go ahead and add the seven, take the square root of both sides, I get a value of three for my constant.